2016, 2017. So yeah, three years. Let's work on like a three year cycle that he's, not cycle, that sounds, I'm not saying he's, he's, on a, he's on drugs. What's up guys, another reaction video today. We're gonna to be watching a very popular YouTube video. I'm guessing most of you have seen it. It's called, I quit my job and became a pro cyclist in 12 months. It's over on the Cycling Pulse YouTube channel. So they're looking at rider Alexander Richardson who now rides for Alpers and Phoenix. It's a really entertaining video. We're gonna watch it from start to finish. I'm gonna pause and give my comments and thoughts along the way. Let's get into it. I have my wife looking at me thinking, this guy has absolutely lost the plot. Which I, which I probably have. <laughs> yeah, people. Okay, so he's quit his job as a stock broker and became a pro cyclist in 12 months. I think that's more for the title of the video. I've already watched this through. It sounds like it was more of a two or three year process, not just one year. So just take that in consideration. The 12 month thing, I'm, I'm sure, is a little bit overhyped. Kind of take a step back and say, whoa, hang on a minute, has this guy completely lost the plot? You know, this is just not normal. He's low, I'm pretty sure that's like an Audi station wagon, nice looking house as well. Uh, he's obviously did pretty well for himself uh, in the stockbroking career. But, uh, okay, so he started, took up road cycling as a hobby in 2015 at 26 years old and they made this video in 2018. So this looks like, if we go from 2015, 2016, 2017. So yeah, three years. Let's work on like a three year cycle that he's, not cycle, that sounds, I'm not saying he's, he's, on, a, he's on drugs. A three year uh, progression for him. For me, certainly, I found it interesting, something I, I was really passionate about, something I enjoyed. Um, I had the possibility to do it. So I kind of thought to myself, why not? You know, and chase a dream, try and be, be someone different. Pretty, pretty muscular guy. Like, if we just look at him here, this might, maybe this was a bit earlier on in his, his career, but if we just, like, bigger build, clearly a little bit late to the sport, it doesn't have that classic sort of super skinny, lean cyclist physique. He's definitely carrying a bit more muscle. So... We, what we don't know is what he did before he took up cycling as a hobby in 2015. It looks like he was either into the gym work, maybe he was doing some running. Um, we're not sure on his athletic background because he's definitely got a very muscular build. So he wasn't just doing, he wasn't just off the couch. That's for sure. So I kind of thought to myself, why not? You know, and chase a dream. Try and be, be someone different or do something different. And it was when I, uh, we had our second child that I took some time off work, you know, so you can see even here this this photo definitely he's got the muscular he's got the pecs muscular chest traps so he's carrying he's carrying a good amount of muscle he definitely wasn't just a um out of shape stockbroker sitting behind the computer and i never went back I'm training I'm oh okay looks like he had a bit of a mask on there let's go back that was only very quick okay looking here you can see he's got this, it's super blurry, but he's got this blue mask on. Initially when I watched this, I thought this was one, maybe one of those, just those air restriction masks, those sort of Bane masks that people wear, but it's not. So he's got a tube, there's a tube running down here, down past the forks. So it looks like he's doing some hypoxic training. So he would have this hooked up to a machine that's reducing the level of oxygen in there and it's simulating riding at altitude. So this isn't just a air restriction mask, it is an altitude simulation mask that he'd be wearing. Are these effective? Based on what I can find, and I'm not an expert in hypoxic simulated training or anything like that, but from what I can find, training in a, in a simulated altitude environment probably doesn't help you much. I'm not sure this would be doing much, but he's... He's, we'll, we'll see the interview. It seems like he's trying a lot of different things, but this one in particular, probably not recommended. The training I was doing, I was probably riding 25, 30 hours a week, every week. That first year I rode something like 27, 28,000 miles, I think. Okay. So he's, he said there that, that year where he went, all right, I'm going to have a crack, 25, 30 hours a week on average, and however, 20, what did he say, 25,000 miles? So just massive, massive volume. He's obviously extremely talented because you could take and must have an, a more of an athletic background because you could take any 
you know, a, a, any random average cyclist that's, you know, I think at this time he was sort of 25, 26 years of age, do the same training, they're not going to get the same response. He obviously got to a very high level in terms of his fitness. And it's pretty clear to me from watching this video and doing it, looking into him a little bit, he's obviously got a lot of talent. Like, because not everyone can go out and just do 25, 30 hour training weeks. Now, he's obviously put a lot of effort to his recovery and things like that. So I'm not saying he hasn't put the work in, but you could get any person to put the same amount of work in and chances are they're not going to respond the same. So it's worth keeping in mind, he's probably very naturally talented to get the, to get the response uh, and must have some sort of athletic background. This is the new Trek Madame. And the old Trek Madame had the brakes on the front. This is a rim brake one. I didn't get the disc because it's like half a kilo heavier. Um, for no aerodynamic gain, so... Yeah, I wouldn't race on it. Smart. So he's gone the he's gone the rim brake option lighter, just as fast. And he's got a canyon I think he gets in yeah, he's, he's so he's he, he sold his Pinarellos and something for a track, so he's he's not short of cash, that's for sure. These are Kogel, Kogel bearings in the bottom bracket, Kogel bearings in the wheels, which are fantastic. Uh, I actually think they're better than ceramic speed because they they don't use uh, washers, um, so they, they just spin a little better. Yeah, that's a good point. If you if you take the washers out of your, your bearings, they spin faster, but they don't last as long, so we'd have to replace them a lot more often. And just in terms of the, the whole ceramic bearing thing in general, in 2019, when I was on the, the Bianchi XR4, I had the ceramic speed oversized pulley wheel, and I also had a ceramic bottom bracket, and that thing spun so amazingly. I don't think... People are kind of like, ah, oh, ceramic, it's just a joke, it's so expensive, blah, 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 it doesn't do anything. I think most of those people haven't ridden with the ceramic speed stuff because it's so, I don't know, maybe the fact that it spins well doesn't matter, but to me, you oh, that was so nice. Like I'm actually considering, I haven't ruled out buying the ceramic speed pulley wheel thing for my for my Devel for this year because I really, I think it shifted great and it spun so well. It's really, really nice stuff. And then I've got the sound system here that's all linked up. Air conditioning through the, um, through the roof, which is operated in the other room. And then I've got a second air conditioning unit just that I put on my face, it's so cool. Yeah, that's really cool. So he's got the, the ducted air conditioning to cool the entire room. And then he also has a separate unit to cool him down even further. And it's really important, especially if you're doing a majority of your training indoors, like he has, like doing it, not just getting on when it's a rainy day or a bit windy outside, like using it as a proper setup. You need to have good cooling. Otherwise, all your training sessions are just going to overheat. And you won't be able to do good power. So really good that he has that whole setup there dialed in. Ever feel tired, uh, log my food and reduce weight every day. And that was just logging it, absolutely everything and cutting it by, cutting the calories by 500 a day. I just did that every day until I got to make some more body fat. I went for a DEXA scan before I had the DEXA scan with one pro just to see where I was at. And the guy said to me there, listen, you're going to start losing, you know, normal bodily functions. So. Okay, I'll pause there. So he said he's to lose weight, he just counted all his calories and then just ran a, I think he said 500 calorie deficit. And that's kind of the problem with the just, especially at the elite level where you're doing this much training, the problem with just counting your calories is that what calories you're eating matter because you need to have carbohydrates at the specific time, you need to have protein at the specific time. So if you're just counting calories overall, and not really putting too much emphasis into what the calories are, you can really run yourself into the ground and your training quality will suffer and you'll get sick. So, I mean, it'll work for him to lose weight. You, know, you said he lost weight, but his performance suffered. So calorie counting at the elite level is not good enough. I wouldn't say not having a team was necessarily that much of a disadvantage. I, I was probably more at an advantage by not having them because I didn't have to work for anyone else. I would argue, or ride for anyone else, or close gaps for anyone else, or myself. Actually, I, I attacked and got about 10 seconds into that corner, um, took the left into the tailwind, and I was like, right, I've got 10 seconds here, might as well just come in. And I looked back, and they weren't really getting organised. And five got off the front of that group that were effectively chasing me, but everyone wants to win themselves, so they're all going to be soft pedalling. And once I'm holding a constant power. It's, you know, they, to bring back, you know, 30, 40 seconds becomes quite difficult. What people didn't know, or, or they should have known, is that I've been full, full time for a couple of years and I can push the pedals when I'm pushing the wind by myself. Yeah, so he answered it there. So he just said, 
most people don't know because he was racing in just black kit, not on a team. Most people didn't know that he'd been training full time for a couple of years. So, yeah, the twelve month thing again. I know I've said it a couple of times in this video. It's more like two or three years. It's just important. Like if you're watching this video, you think he just blew everyone out of the water in a year. It's not true. It's a longer time period. Your body doesn't respond to training that quickly unless you're on drugs. Um, what else? The other thing to mention is that he felt he had an advantage by not being on the team. I think that's definitely true, but the only problem with not being on a team is it's very difficult to learn how to race. If you don't have people to give, to get advice off, to teach you how to do things, to, to go with you in races and tell you when to attack and tell you when to not follow moves, you're going to learn that all for yourself. It's really, really, really difficult. So... Um, it's very commendable that he managed to learn this race craft and, and the skills and everything like that, doing it mostly on his own. It's really difficult. Um, so I've granted a little bit of leeway, maybe underestimated, but yeah, jokes on them. Yes, Ernie! Yeah! Come on, Ernie! I, I would say a few people congratulated me after the race because everyone genuinely, there was a lot of people that thought I'd was on drugs or whatever. I've been sick. Yeah. I'm glad he brought it up because that's what I was thinking too first time I watched this video. So let me explain. Short rise to fitness and performance in, in a relatively short time frame. He's from the finance scene. And that's the thing is like cycling, cycling in the past has had a drug problem at the top of the sport. But in general, cycling at a club level or and just domestically, drugs aren't really a thing as they are in other scenes. So like, example, the gym scene, the fitness injury, drugs are just a part of a part of it. You join the gym, you you take SARMs or you take tests. It's just that's just part of it. There's nothing weird about that. Same in finance. Like if you're in the I'm not sure what sort of finance he was in, but it's not odd to take riddle and Adderall other drugs it's just part of the it's just normal it's not even a, a thing whereas in cycling i like to think that drugs aren't it's sort of you don't need to take them it's not really part of the culture that's probably anything drugs aren't part of the culture in most of cycling as they are in some other some other things as i just described so he's and he's, he's a bit older late 20s a lot of money so a lot of flags there that would suggest that there's a potential um he may have taken drugs. Now, I'm not saying, I'm 100% not saying he is, and he's admitted that there, that a lot of people think he did. So that's just, that's the reality of, of coming into the sport late and coming from a scene that has a bit of a drug culture. Um, so let's continue on with the video. Feeling here, I've been trying this out for about three or four, three or four weeks now. So, yeah, we'll see, we'll see. I can't really, I think it does work, and I think I'm a good responder, but I need a, a little bit more time to... So what it does... All right. So he's in an altitude tent here sleeping in it. A couple of things. He just said, really good point, that he thinks he's a responder. And he, he must have a coach. I, I, I'm, I'd be amazed if he was figuring this stuff out on his own. He must have someone who knows what I'm talking about because with altitude training, it does appear that there are responders and non-responders. So there are some people where they'll do this simulated sleeping at altitude and they just won't respond. Just doesn't do anything. And then there are other people that they do see a gain. Um, other thing with this is it's not just like you go into it at 10 o'clock at night, sleep in it for eight hours and pop out. To get the benefit, they've found you need to be in there for longer periods of time. So ideally, you'd be going in there like, I have to guess the numbers, I can't remember exactly, but it's more like 12 to 14 hours you would want to be having at that simulated altitude. So it's a massive pain in the ass to do for a potentially moderate to small gain if you're a responder. So the whole simulated altitude thing, and you have to manage your training well as well. It's not like you can just do your normal training and go sleep in the tent because it's a massive stress on the body. So huge minefield, a lot of potential downsides. Hard to know if it's going to be a benefit. I don't really recommend the altitude tents, but let's just hear what he has to say. And you can raise your hemocrit level. So, you know, I've, I've had mine tested and it's like, in athletes, it's typically quite low. But, you know, the average person is somewhere between 38 and 50. And mine's like 43, naturally. Um, but with that, you can get it up to 40, 46, 47 maybe, 40, 45, 46, 47. So what that represents is a, you know, a 2 or 3% increase in oxygen, um, which 2 or 3% on your threshold is a winter's training. Yeah, so that's not... He's saying there are 2 or 3% increase in oxygen and increase in markers. But what they found is that that doesn't mean a 2 or 3% increase in performance. And that's 
sort of the problem here is some of these studies where you're looking at altitude and they go, yeah, it stimulates, you know, red blood cell production and increases in hemoglobin. But does that increase performance? And that's where it, there's not necessarily a direct link. So you got to be careful if someone says, oh, it boosts your hemoglobin by so-and-so percent or boosts this by so-and-so percent. Does that necessarily mean an increase in performance? And that's where I'm not too sure um, and is sort of questionable. So for most people, I'd say don't. Even though it's very tempting, it looks kind of cool and sexy to do the whole altitude tent thing, I would sort of steer clear. We'll end the reaction video there, but let's jump onto his pro cycling stats and see how he's gone recently. Because that video was in 2018, I think. So he joined Alperson Phoenix in 2020. So let's see, like, how, where is he now? Is he, he continued progressed or or not? Let's have a look. So he's done some 2.1s, Czech Tour, Tour de Wallonie, that's a big race, uh, a, two point, uh, a pro race. So looking here, not really any results. Seventh in a team time trial. Eleventh in a team time trial. Looking here, so not really any, no results of note in 2020. This year, 2021, let's have a look again. DNF disqualified. Interesting. Don't see that very often. Um, not really. Another fifth, but that was in a team time trial. So I don't know, maybe Alperson are using him as more of a domestique and he's not getting opportunities for himself or maybe he's just uh, struggling a bit at that higher level. But um, yeah, unfortunately, you know, it would have been a lovely story if he managed to get on Alperson Phoenix and then be smashing out results on that higher level internationally. Uh, doesn't look like it's the case yet. Not sure what he's doing next year. But I'll end the video there. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.